Michael Gellert, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be well, here. After some technical challenges, we've been struggling with uh, getting linked up here for, uh, boy, about 20, 25 minutes. So I'm glad we finally got everything working. But we're going to be discussing your recent book, The Divine Mind, Exploring the Psychological History of God's Inner Journey. Now, I want to jump in right away and ask you to reassure any listeners who might be offended by the idea of exploring the psychological history of God's inner journey. They might be thinking, how can this guy know anything about God's inner journey? So, <laughs> Well, it does uh, seem to be an absurdity that we can imagine that we know what goes on inside God, inside his mind, inside his heart. Uh, I'm not claiming any particular uh, access to that any better than anybody else has. Okay. Most of what the book uh, is about, it looks at uh, the uh, scriptures of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as well as the writings uh, after those scriptures were closed, canonized and closed, right up through the mystics of the Me Middle Ages and up to modern times. Uh, and I'm looking at the hints that scripture and the sacred writings of the uh, mystics uh, uh, say or offer us that give us a sense that God is actually going through his own inner journey. He is, yes, going through uh, his own religious experience. Well, maybe, maybe what we could say is, is that the people who wrote those scriptures that evolved and changed over time, the depiction of God, which is, you know, perhaps our projection, and that changed over time. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, we're looking at uh, these projections, these metaphors. Uh, really, the only way we know God is through our own experience. So when you look at the evolution of God through uh, all these uh, centuries, what you also see is that our own understanding is evolving, our own capacity for insight, and the two go hand in hand. Uh, but we shouldn't uh, minimize uh, the power of a projection. Uh, they're very powerful. We have to remember that, uh, for example, in ancient Greece, when the Greeks saw Pan at his noonday or midnight hour, which he often appeared, they would see Pan literally in front of them, hoofing and puffing and stamping on his uh, goat uh, hooved feet as if he himself were having a panic attack. Now today we don't experience panic that way, we experience it internally. Uh, but in their day they experienced uh, panic externally and that is because back then the dividing line between the ego and the mythopoetic or imaginal psyche, the uh, collective unconscious where these experiences come from, the dividing line between the unconscious and the ego wasn't so sharp. Yeah, I remember, I'm remembering a book to that effect. Maybe you know the title of the book that I'm thinking about. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I wish James, I could give you more hint. James, uh, the bicameral the mind. The, the, yeah, the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Right, and he makes that uh, that argument very forcefully that uh, we that back in those days the the line between what we call reality and and the internal world was not so sharply drawn and experienced yes. as it is for most of us today. That's right. Uh, his actual physiological theory of what goes on in the brain has been uh, more or less discarded because of the findings of recent neuroscience. So his explanation of how that works wasn't quite um, holding up. Yeah. So there are other authors who say the same thing, Eric Neumann, uh, particularly in Jungian psychology. And if we just stay in the realm of psychology, it's safe to say that the ego had not yet clearly separated out of the unconscious and that things were experienced, what we experience in dreams and visions 
was the way the ancients actually uh, experienced externally. So when you read the Hebrew Bible, all these wonderful, miraculous stories of Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew Bible, they actually may have experienced them exactly the way they described them, because they, there was no inner and outer to make a projection a projection. They saw it and they lived it as if it were right before their eyes. You know, and I think that helps us make sense of uh, the reports of so-called uh, primitive peoples, that there's, you know, there are still tribes that exist in various parts of the world, and they have shaman, and shaman report these, ex these same sorts of experiences, not as imaginary experiences, but really as something that they vividly and fully experience in their reality. That, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, the anthropologist Levi Bruhl, and Jung borrowed a lot uh, from him talking about this issue as well, called this participatio mystique, a mystical participation between the individual and the world uh, around them. So uh, yes, that's, uh, that's uh, true with the primitives as well. Yeah, you know, now, it, in the, go ahead. Just add, yeah. the word symbol uh, or myth was not a word in the language of the ancients or of uh, primitive cultures because you only know a symbol when you're outside of it and you can see it as a symbol. They uh -huh. were in it, living it daily. Yeah. The real thing. Yeah, yeah. So that it's is a, thing. That's, that's an important the real thing for us. Yeah. It's still the real thing for us, except we need to go inside to encounter that. Uh -huh. dreams or visions or meditation or our imagination cultivating the the religious imagination right and i want to remind people since i haven't introduced you as a jungian analyst that you are in fact a jungian analyst okay. and so uh, uh that's why you're uh, uh using some of the terms that you are and one term that you use in the book is uh the Abrahamic religions. And so it probably would make sense to say something about what you're getting at there. Sure. Uh, the Abrahamic religions are those traditions that originated with Abraham in the Hebrew Bible and his revelation from God. Uh, and those religions are basically Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Although each of those traditions have different theologies uh, and different explanations of their origins, they all agree on the main source or origin, which was the encounter between Abraham and God. Now, there are a couple of other minor, more than a couple, there are about five or six minor uh, Abrahamic traditions. Uh, the Samaritans, whom we hear about in the New Testament, are still around and living in the Middle East. The Baha'i faith, these also go back to Abraham, and there's a few others as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the main ones, and these are the ones I talk about in the Divine Mind, are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Okay. And, and as you mentioned when we first started talking about the book, uh, you, in the book you examine the evolution across uh, three periods of time. And so let's start with the vision of God that comes through in the, well, in the Old Testament or older versions of, uh, maybe not everybody calls it the Old Testament. What are we talking about here? Well, uh, yes, that's, that's right. Uh, actually, the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, people tend to think these two are synonymous. The contents are the same in both. But the Hebrew Bible is the original version that the authors uh, organized into a text that has three parts. And what the Old Testament is, is a rearrangement of the last two parts. So actually, what Christians understand as the Old Testament is different in, than what the Jews understand as the Hebrew Bible. And the difference is largely that the arc of God's inner journey is different, tells a very different story with a different conclusion than the Old Testament. 
And the Old Testament was revised actually by the New Testament uh, editors. Uh, they wanted to make the Old Testament and the New Testament dovetail each other. And therefore they rearranged it so that uh, that would happen. Yeah, my wife read this book that she told me about, and I should have read it. Uh, God's, um, again, you might know it. It's, it describes in great detail how the, uh, how the Bible, and I don't remember if it was just the New Testament, it was sort of more or less in Elizabethan times, I think, that a committee made a lot of decisions about what would be considered, what would go in the Bible and what should not. It was a committee decision, which I find. Well, uh, there was the, uh, I think it was in the fourth century, the Nicaea Creed or committee uh, decided what would go in to the New Testament and what would be considered either apocryphal or even heretical. I'm not sure about uh, when the Old Testament was uh, uh, codified. It was definitely um, in the Christian era. It was after the uh, second or third century, I believe. And it could have been in the Middle Ages when um, King James's version of the uh, Bible was uh, codified by a committee under King James. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking of. It was like God's copywriters or God's something like that. Uh, so what's the vision that comes through, the vision of God that comes through this first phase that we would relate to the Old Testament or parts of the Quran and, uh, uh, and what was the other, the other book? I'm <laughs> not doing very well here. New Testament. Okay, the New Testament. Okay. I thought the New Testament comes along later, though. Well, the, the uh, Hebrew Bible uh, goes from roughly 2000 BC to 200 BC. And that's the first phase, the original vision okay. of God, which more or less Jews, Christians, and Muslims all agree upon. Okay. The second that vision phase, of God is... And the vision of God is, as you read uh, in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, uh, the image of uh, uh, God the Creator that we have in the book of Genesis. He then evolves into a war god, uh, particularly uh, during the Exodus and after the Exodus when the Israelites uh, were led by God into the land of Canaan and the promised land, and they had to conquer all the different uh, peoples who were at that time inhabiting the land. And we here see that uh, Yahweh is very much a kind of commander in chief. He is like the war gods of all the other Near Eastern and the Greek uh, cultures uh, as well. Um, and he's experienced uh, externally. He's modeled as a kind of superhuman hero. He is even visualized as having a body. Um, and he's an, very much containing our anthropomorphic projections of what God is. Yeah, for, so for example, uh, he's described as an angry God, as a jealous God. Is that part of this first That's Right. Period? He's an angry so these, these sound very much like uh, human emotions and human uh, limitations. Yes, and his behaviors are very human too. Uh, you can count uh, at least 70 separate episodes of genocide in the Hebrew Bible that Yahweh ordered the Israelites to commit. Uh, so we think of genocide as a relatively modern phenomenon. The word genocide it comes from uh, the last century, but uh, the actual practice of it, all the uh, ancient uh, cultures practiced it, believe it or not. They felt that uh, to conquer an enemy uh, who didn't surrender voluntarily, they needed to be extinguished. Man, woman, child, even their animals. So you get this image of God that is anthropomorphic, but also quite brutal, quite tyrannical. Uh, I quote Freud in uh, 
the divine mind as saying that he is an uncanny demon or volcano god who walks about at night and strikes without warning. Um, he was, um, he was a, quite a, a character and he had his own, uh, and this is the uh, thing I try to show very much in uh, The Divine Mind, that he had his own uh, sense of rejections from the Israelites because they were very ambivalent about uh, taking on this God as uh, their God. So uh, every time he felt rejected, he would act out in this uh, wrathful way. And what you really see is a God who feels uh, rejected and scorned. And that creates a kind of dynamic that runs right through the Hebrew Bible. And it's the main thrust of the story. The people bond with God, then they tire of him or they fear him, and then they go into idolatry as other ways of worship. And God reacts punitively, then the people reconnect. And it goes like that from the beginning to the end of the uh, Bible, starting with the uh, exile from the Garden of Eden, and then Noah's flood. And finally, you come at, toward the end of the Bible to um, uh, the Babylonian exile. Um, which is a whole episode on its own. Now, that phase of God's journey ends around 200 BC, and then you get the further scriptures and traditions that evolve out of Judaism. Okay, now before you go there, I just want to underscore uh, the idea that this is maybe not a picture of God as much as it is a picture of our projections of the primitive state of our consciousness at that period. Yes. During that period. Yes, yeah. that's right. The history or the inner journey of God is our history of his inner journey. What he actually was going through, that's a mystery. But if we follow uh, the scriptures and then the sacred writings that came after the scriptures, there's a sense that God is evolving. And yes, he's evolving in the same parallel way as our consciousness is. And as we become more refined, more sophisticated, more humanitarian, so does God. So you finally come up to the mystics where God is empty. Wait, wait, wait you're leaping ahead though, I'm over one, ahead. <laughs> over the second. Let's go to the second phase oh, first. So, uh, so uh, tell us about how that vision changes in the New Testament, the Talmud, and the Quran. Right, it bifurcates and each tradition, God goes off on a somewhat uh, different direction. His personality evolves, but essentially the features that connect all these traditions together in the second phase is that God becomes more humanistic. He becomes more humanitarian. There you begin to uh, hear the uh, authors of the New Testament and the Talmud talk about God as a source of divine love, God as a source of mercy. Uh, he becomes uh, less egotistical and tyrannical than he was in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, there's a definite evolution in ethics, uh, the capacity to experience God internally increases. In the Hebrew Bible, God was experienced collectively. It was a theophany as the only way to see God. So everybody would be gathered together, except, of course, the prophets like Moses and Ezekiel. They had a unique experience of God. But it was essentially a collective uh, vision. In the second phase, you begin to get also, especially with the Gnostics, the idea that the individual can find God within themselves. And uh, Jesus' core message was the kingdom of God is within you. So there you really begin to get uh, an indication that the human psyche is the source of religious experience. That's a beginning. It uh, doesn't fully reach its stride until the third phase. Okay. now. Uh... It's very interesting to me because I grew up in a uh, fundamentalist Christian environment. And so 
it, what you're saying helps to resolve, I think, a, a philosophical or problem that I think I experienced as a young person. I don't know that I ever fully articulated it, you know, in the way that comes to mind now, of the uh, seeming inconsistency between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that uh, there's this very different experience or way that God is being portrayed, you know, that we've moved from this vengeful, jealous kind of God and all this genocide that you referred to, to now a, a, a more love-oriented God who's uh, sent his only son to, uh, to go through the crucifixion and so on to save us all from sin. Um, so you, you used a word that I have not heard before there. What was it? It was theosoph theophany. The theosophany, yeah. Theophany. It's, it's the... Uh, spell, spell it for us and then define it, if you will. T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Oh, theosophany, the okay. is like an F, pronounced like an F. And that's a big shift between the first and the second phase, because there, at the end of the first era, the, the idea of the theophany more or less ends. So God does not appear to all the people all at the same time, like he does in, at Sinai, where they could see all the people together. They could see the light of uh, the burning bush on the mountain. Uh, they could see the cloud that led them through the desert. They could all experience the manna, the food that God dropped from the heavens down to the people so they could eat in the desert. That kind of collective experience ends. And that has posed a real problem uh, right through the centuries uh, to modern times, because people today, they still ask questions like, for example, this terrible episode that happened last week at uh, that school in uh, Florida. Why does God allow these terrible things to happen? Why did he allow the Holocaust to happen? Why do wars happen? Uh, you see, in the old model of the theophany, God could appear and correct those things. But in the second phase, there's not only an enhancement of God's humanitarianism, but there's uh, an enhancement of free will on the part of humans, so that it is no longer left up to God to shape our history. We have our own free will. We're responsible for the evil that uh, we commit. And it's up to us to make a change in that. Uh, God helps those who help themselves kind of thing. So you see, when people ask today uh, why God let the Holocaust happen, well, he didn't let it happen. He just no longer interferes in history in the same way that he did. The, the era of theophanies are over so that we're not dependent on God in a kind of slavish way where he appears, tells us what to do, and we do it. It's up to us. And that's the big shift from the first to the second phase. Hmm. We're almost uh, heading towards an ex existential viewpoint uh, where we are forced to take uh, responsibility for what's happening in the world. And That's for right. our, our part in it, which right. maybe becomes more articulated in the third phase. I don't know. The, That's right. The, the, the third phase is moving along is that uh, the, the vision of God changes with the Jewish, the Christian, and the Islamic mystics. And it's fascinating that there are these mystics from different traditions who who what they're saying really tends to overlap and, uh, and have a lot of similarities regardless of what tradition they're coming out of. Yes, with the mystics, you find uh, that they agree with each other. And in fact, they didn't work uh, in an isolated way. Uh, the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim mystics all knew what the others were doing. And essentially, if you were to take, uh, let's say, uh, a dozen quotes from the Jewish mystics, the Kabbalists, 
and make a column and then make a separate column of quotes from the Christian mystics and then a final column of quotes from the Islamic mystics and you took away their names underneath those quotes, often you wouldn't know which tradition was saying what because they share more in common with each other than they often did with the followers of their own traditions. So here you find that the bifurcation in the Abrahamic traditions that happened in the second phase comes together in the third phase, and there's a great similarity. But we also have to remember that the mystics were a minority tradition yes. in the larger uh, uh, organized uh, traditions of the three uh, religions. And uh, the way I understand that is that the reason why they're as similar as they are, and this is not based on extensive study, but, <laughs> but it's my impression, is that they, what they have in common is that they've gone inside and they've really deeply explored their inner world rather than what's been delivered to them and uh, by tradition or authority. And they discover some basic things about the inner human experience uh, the, and the farther reaches of it, I would say. Yes, and you could say that the mystics were the uh, precursors, the forerunners of uh, psychology. Uh, some of them had uh, very uh, elaborate systems of the psyche. Uh, the Kabbalists with their uh, tree of life, uh, showing the different uh, attributes of God. There are also different attributes of our own psyche. Uh, the um, uh, teachings of St. John of the Cross had a very uh, explicit systematic methodology of inner transformation. So uh, you're right about that. And, um, and uh, what you really see in the third phase is a flowering of the basic uh, contribution I mentioned earlier of Jesus when he said, the kingdom of God is within us. Mm -hmm. Here you really see with the mystics, they really, uh, you know, they go, to, they go to the market with that. They really uh, take that to its full uh, limit. Yeah. So, how does what you've described as God's inner journey uh, relate to us and our own inner journey? Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Well, that uh, arc of his journey that we just uh, talked about, uh, coming from the idea of God as an external being who is a kind of super human hero, and then he evolves into a more humanitarian God where there's more of an I-thou dialogue, as Martin Buber would call it, you described it very well as a kind of existential shift. And then you come to the third phase where everything we associate with God is emptied out of our psyches. Uh, the experience of emptiness, which you usually think of the Zen Buddhists when you hear that, is very central to the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic mystics. They all have an experience of God's oneness, oneness in all of nature, oneness among all of us. All of us are manifestations of the same Godhead. All of that uh, uh, is an emptying out of the contents we originally perceived God through. He's no longer a particular superhuman hero. He is much closer in many ways to what scientists um, talk about when they talk about God uh, and closer to what Spinoza talked about when he talked about uh, the divine, a kind of being who is in and as nature. Um, so uh, that arc is something actually, if you look at a human life, most of us go through. Children cannot appreciate the idea of God the way uh, someone like Meister Eckhart or Moses Cordovero from the Kabbalistic tradition uh, talk about. They often experience God uh, the way the Israelites did, as a, a being, as a person. And then as we grow older, if we're evolving 
we come to the second phase, but within ourselves, where we begin to ha ask questions and not agree with everything that God necessarily said in the old, older traditions. We develop a more of an I-Thou relationship. We uh, develop a side of God that is much more multifaceted, not just two sides, good and evil. We begin to see the gray between the opposites. And then if we come into a more mature, adult-like vision of God for ourselves uh, coming from uh, our deep psyches, where we might have a religious experience of one kind or another, well, th there we're in the third phase of God's journey as depicted in uh, history, but it's a psychological uh, phase for us. So here we see that the historical phases of God's evolution parallel very nicely for most of us the evolution of uh, God within ourselves, uh, the evolution of the God image as Jung talked about it. I think this is a fascinating topic. I'm wondering what personally motivated you. Writing a book like this involves a lot of scholar scholarship, a lot of time, and uh, it must require a certain amount of passion, I would think, to pursue something like this. How do you relate that to your own personal journey? Uh, well, in the introduction uh, to the book, I say a little bit about that. I could add a, a little uh, more here. Uh, of course, when I was a young uh, a child, I had this very childlike idea of God. I went to a Jewish religious school, so I read all the stories in the Bible, and I had this idea of God as he's uh, imaged there. Uh, a little bit later, when I was around 11 years old or so, uh, I was studying with a rabbi that uh, my parents arranged uh, tutorials uh, for me with, and uh, he introduced me to the Talmud. And the Talmud, which belongs to that second phase of uh, God's evolution, really struck me uh, in a very visceral way as being a departure from the God of the Hebrew Bible. Suddenly God becomes much more sophisticated, much more introspective, uh, much more, uh, uh, there's a greater emphasis on philosophy. The 613 uh, laws of the Hebrew Bible, of, of the Mosaic Code, suddenly become a source of dialogue among the rabbis. That had a very deep impression on me. And then at around age 15, uh, another rabbi I was studying with saw that I was getting a little bit impatient with uh, uh, studying just the holidays and the liturgy. And he introduced me to the stories of the Hasidic and Kabbalah masters. And that really, had a profound impact on, on me. Mm -hmm. uh, you really see that uh, God manifests in the uh, everyday lives of these masters in a way that is very intimate and uh, very alive. Um, and then in the uh, introduction, I mentioned an experience uh, that happened to me. I uh, had the two of that kind, which introduced me to the experiential side of the mystics. I, uh, in both uh, episodes, uh, I had fallen into a kind of a personal crisis with a depression. In the first one, I was uh, traveling in India and I had uh, a close brush with death. Uh, those led to a kind of awakening that um, introduced me to the uh, mysticism of all the world traditions. And uh, by the time I come to uh, writing this book, I wanted to focus on what it was in particular that the Abrahamic traditions have to offer us. Because, uh, you know, as, as you know, in the last uh, 30, 40 years, there's been a real tendency for Westerners to look to the East for mm -hmm. mystical wisdom and for a guide to religious experience. But everything that we find in the East, we find in the mysticism of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as well. And one of the things that inspired me to write the book was to reintroduce Westerners and uh, uh, 
um, Muslims to their own traditions from a slightly different point of view, which is this point of view of his psychological inner journey. Yeah, in fact, um, you were talking about uh, how Westerners have tended to look to the East, and I saw in your biography that you spent two years in a uh, in a Zen monastery in Japan. Uh, yes, it was part the, of your arc. <laughs> yes, it was part of my arc. It, it was um, the uh, Zendo uh, styled after the basic uh, training that goes on in the Zen monasteries. I uh, discovered uh, Zen in uh, a deeper way when I was in graduate school, and uh, I uh, was reading the accounts, the autobiographical and biographical accounts of the Zen masters. I originally wanted uh, David to study with a Kabbalah rabbi, a Kabbalistic rabbi. And my rabbi in Montreal, where I uh, grew up, tried to uh, find me such a rabbi, but none of them would uh, accept me into uh, uh, a pursuit of Kabbalistic wisdom because uh, I lacked some of the basic qualifications. Um, so that uh, dovetailed with my discovery of these writings by the Zen masters, and I said, ah, they're experiencing the exact same thing that the Kabbalah masters are experiencing. Fascinating. And they accept me easily because I don't need a lot of prerequisites, and that's how I ended up in Japan. Huh. <laughs> that's a fascinating story. And uh, what was it that made you want to become a Jungian analyst? I assume that's temporarily further down the line. Uh, yes, that is, that is a later development. Um, when I um, discovered uh, uh, Zen uh, teachings on meditation, I was practicing uh, Buddhist meditation with a, a particular group, not the one in Japan, it was uh, in Montreal. And um, they were, um, they were a complicated uh, group, and I wasn't quite sure if I was getting the original teachings of Buddhism or something that was a, a mix-max of eclectic teachings that had uh, certain fundamentalisms about it and uh, certain mm -hmm. New Age aspects. And um, I had a dream one night <laughs> that completely answered that question for me in a way that I could understand, even before I had ever studied uh, dream psychology. Uh, I was a uh, student of comparative religion. Uh, I hadn't really uh, discovered Jung yet, uh, but when I had this dream, um, I wanted to learn more about who designed this dream, because clearly it was more <laughs> intelligent than I am. <laughs> Uh, it right. answered my dilemmas in a way that my mind wasn't able to wrap around uh, what it was saying until I saw it very clearly in the dream. Can so you share I, the dream with us? Uh, yes, I could. Uh, to make a, uh, uh, a long story short, the dream went on for about 20 minutes. Wow. In the dream, it was 1974 that I had this dream, and it was not long after the uh, Watergate episode. And uh, I found myself on the uh, floor of uh, the Republican National Convention to elect the Republican candidate for the next presidential election. And uh, I was wondering, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, I wasn't even American at the time. Well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, was a, it was very alive. It was just like being on the floor of a, the convention hall, I would imagine. There were balloons flying everywhere and the people with their placards and on the name of the placards was the state they were from. And uh, it was a very busy, active scene. And there up on the bleachers uh, were a row of people who were um, doing, um, what is it called in baseball when they take up the signs and they show the signs? There's a word for it. Um, uh, I'm not enough of a baseball fan. I'm not a baseball uh, fan. Yeah, I don't know. They, they spell out signs. And what was uh, spelled out 
were the letters in a linear fashion, M and then I and then C, um, K. And these were all signs, you know, each letter had its own sign and it was huge. And eventually it went to K, E, Y, and then there was a gap and then came M, O, U, and then I saw clearly <laughs> Mickey Mouse what you're saying was Mickey Mouse. Yeah. And I right away knew that the dream was telling me that the group I was training with were a Mickey Mouse version of Buddhism. Wow, interesting. <laughs> and and it crazy. reminds me of, of Jung's dream where uh, he has this image of God mm -hmm. defecating on the church. It's a similar kind of uh, self-expression of the unconscious sharing its own viewpoint yeah, really. on something organized because this group was a small organized yeah. religious group and the unconscious uh, or we could say the designer of the dream uh, didn't like it, didn't like this group. Uh, what was also interesting about it, it was being spelled out for me as if the unconscious were kind of making fun of me saying, yeah. do you really need to have this spell out for you? Yeah. yeah. So when I were dummy, I, look at this. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. You're on the head with it. Um, so of course I left that group and eventually I found my way to an authentic uh, uh, Zen group that has lineage going all the way back to Bodhidharma who uh, brought uh, Buddhism from India into uh, Tibet and China. Um, but it also, uh, you know, I was in my 20s uh, in that year that I had that dream and uh, I wanted to learn more about who designed this dream in me. How can a part of me know something so clearly when my ego is completely confused? Uh, so I started reading Freud. I wanted to know more about this uh, dream designer. Um, and I got a, uh, some very good insights from Freud, but I wasn't quite getting the spiritual dimension of our dreams. He didn't really quite talk about that. And then that brought me to Jung. And when I read Jung, uh, I right away knew that this man knows about this aspect of the psyche. And that began my uh, journey to become an analyst. Yeah, and he also remarked about this tendency to look for religious experience in other cultures and kind of urged people to, you know, look to your to that culture that you grew up in and find the the uh, the pearl there. Yeah, Jung uh, felt that uh, we have a lot we can learn from the Eastern traditions, uh, not only their psychologies but uh, many of their skill sets, but that the Westerner is probably better off going into uh, his or her own tradition because that's what his or her psyche is endowed with. Uh, our mm -hmm. connection to the collective unconscious is most immediately through our own traditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just curious, during your time in Buddhism, and particularly at the, in the the monastery, did you have any sort of uh, breakthrough, Satori experience? Not long after, I had uh, an experience that uh, seemed disconnected from uh, my uh, training in Japan. It had been uh, about two years after I left uh, my uh, uh, studying with my teacher in Japan. I had relocated to a New York City. And uh, the experience I describe uh, in the introduction to the divine mind uh, is that experience. And it really was uh, kind of uh, fashioned uh, and I think made possible because of the years of uh, training I had in Zen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed that you're uh, a licensed clinical social worker and I'm not sure that uh, many people in my audience are aware that they can become a Jungian analyst uh, with that degree. Um, are there many such people that you're aware of? Who? 
Yes, today there, there are. Um, you know, the traditional uh, way somebody would uh, become a, either a Freudian or a Jungian psychoanalyst, well, certainly a Freudian analyst, but a Jungian analyst was through having an MD, a medical degree. But that has broadened uh, in all forms of analysis so that now uh, you can come in with a master's degree in social work or the MFT, the Master of Family and or Marriage, Family and Therapy degree. I think even registered uh, psychiatric nurses can be qualified uh, for Jungian training. Um, so basically you need a license to practice psychotherapy and a good few years of clinical experience, uh, your own personal analysis, and that qualifies somebody to apply for Jungian training. Yeah. So there's a fair, fair spread of different traditions uh, yeah. academically. Yeah. Well, um, I wonder if, as we wind down here, if there are uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience. Final thoughts. Well, um, <laughs> you know, we live in a very difficult and dark times today. And the mystics, which is the high point of the evolution of uh, uh, Western and Islamic religion taught that it's important to come to terms with this dark side of life and to understand that it is there also in our religious traditions, both historically, there have been inquisitions, there have been uh, holy crusades, but the mystics themselves, they hold the opposites of the light and the dark sides of God together in a way that allows us to integrate them, not only side by side with each other, but into our approach to life, so that we uh, remain very conscious of the dark side, but we work with the positive side, which gives us uh, wisdom and insight, uh, gives us compassion and the ability to love one another. The mystics had no quarrels with each other, not like the religions do with each other today, the followers. So uh, my final uh, thoughts would be that the more we cultivate our inner depths and connect to the God within us, the more we also connect with each other. And uh, if we connect with each other deeply enough, we are, whether we recognize it in the moment or not, we are bringing God into the world. That is what the Kabbalists call uh, tikkun olam, the repair of the broken world. We raise it one person at a time. But if we all do this together, the world around us can also transform. That's a great wrap up. So okay. <laughs> Michael Gellert, I wanna thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. And thank you, David, for having me. <laughs>